We recently, as a church, uh, finished reading the book of Revelation in our Bible reading plan, and today we're going to finish uh, our series of six messages on Revelation uh, by looking at uh, what it says about paradise, especially in the final two chapters, although it does uh, picture paradise often throughout the book. But today we're going to look at what it says in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne say, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be, live with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty I will give to drink without cost, from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and with twelve angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. He measured its wall and it was 144 cubits thick by man's measurement, which the angel was using. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of pure gold, like transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut. For there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him, 
They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. This ends the reading of God's word, and God always blesses his word to those who listen. Behold, I am making all things new. I saw new heavens and a new earth. The Bible speaks again and again of this tremendous recreation, renewal, restoration of God's universe. Jesus himself speaks of the rebirth or the regeneration. When the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, the whole universe reborn. The Apostle Peter preached he must remain in heaven until the time of the restoration of all things. The Apostle Paul writes that the creation will be freed from its bondage to decay into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. This tremendous rebirth, restoration of all things, the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. Already hundreds of years before Jesus came, the prophet Isaiah said, Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind, but be glad and rejoice in what I will create. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. There is this tremendous new universe which God has prepared for those who love Him. And this new creation is an earthly creation, a new heaven, but also a new earth. Revelation emphasizes that this is not just an existence somewhere in the clouds or somewhere in an indefinite fog bank. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign, where? On the earth. Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And the prayer he taught us is, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In a sense, Revelation is simply an explanation of the process by which that prayer is answered. When you read the book of Revelation, you find in the early chapters after the message to each of the seven churches, a vision of heaven, and God's will is done in heaven. And everybody in heaven is praising the Father and praising the Lamb and the angels and the saints and all in heaven are praising and it is perfectly ordered according to God's will. And then at the end of Revelation, you see heaven coming to earth and earth is glorious and beautiful and all are praising God and everything is ordered according to God's will. We pray that God's will is done perfectly on earth as it's already done perfectly in heaven. And the new creation is the answer to that prayer when earth is everything God meant it to be, everything he originally designed it to be when he made the original paradise. And now he's going to make the fully matured and perfect paradise, and it's going to be an earthly paradise. And that means, among other things, that it's physical or bodily. Our final home is on a physical earth that we can touch and see, in fact, an earth very much like our own, only new and improved and purified. Heaven comes down to earth. When people die, their souls live in heaven in an existence that's hard for us to imagine, but we know they go to be with Christ, to enjoy conscious communion with Christ, and to reign with Christ, as Revelation portrays it. But we also know that that's not our final destiny. Our final destiny is not heaven in heaven. Our final destiny is heaven on earth. We're earthly creatures, we're bodily, and we're meant to have bodies for eternity. And when Jesus comes again, those souls that have been in heaven will receive new resurrection bodies, and those who are still living on earth will have their bodies instantly transformed, and God will bring about his new heaven and new earth. And that means, too, that God's original creation is not just a sinking ship. There is a great transformation where the old order of things passes away, and yet this world, though it will perish, is going to be raised again, just like our bodies. 
which perish, and then we receive a new body. But in another sense, it's not just a totally new body, totally different. We're still us. It's our body, recognizable, only transformed and made better. And that's true of the whole earth, the whole creation. It'll perish at the end, but then rise again in freshness and newness and perfection and glory. And that also means that the eternal pleasures on the new earth are going to be coming from the creator of this earth. Some of us say, well, you know, um, I'd rather go to heaven than hell, but if I had my druthers, I might just rather stay here right now and, uh, you know, keep on if life is going well for you. People aren't always so eager for the new heavens and the new earth. But the fact of the matter is that the one who invented this earth and made all the things we enjoy most on this earth is also the creator of the new earth. And there, the pleasures won't be mixed with miseries. And there, the things that spoil the creation now are going to be removed, and so the creation will be what it's meant to be in perfection. And the things that we delight in most now will still be there or have something that's even better that surpasses the delights that we know now. So when we think of that um, coming new heaven and new earth, we need to realize that it's earthly, that it's physical, that it's bodily, and you should not get lost in that notion about your eternal state as an eternal uh, fog bank with a bit of light in it. It is simply being restored to be who you were meant to be and the creation made to be what it's meant to be. Now when we think about paradise, one of the great things to know about paradise is what's not there. We'll talk about what is in paradise, but first, what's not? Satan is not in paradise. His demons are not in paradise. You and I do not know what it's like to live in a world without demonic influences at work wrecking things, whispering lies in our ear, trying to divide people against each other, trying to poison our relationship with God. We, we don't notice most of the time directly what Satan and his demons are up to, but we've never lived in a world where they have not been active. We will find out what it's like when all of those demonic influences are gone. There will be no more evil in the world. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful. And that means that every person who is there is going to be somebody who has been perfected. Everything wrong with you, everything sinful about you will be cleansed and taken away. And so you won't be a bother and an offense to anybody else, nor they to you, because we'll each be made perfect there. And those who refuse Jesus, who don't want Jesus, who don't want to be with Jesus, they simply won't be there. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, says Revelation. No hospitals. No cemeteries. No funerals. No places of mourning and sorrow, no counseling clinics for those who are struggling in their life with past traumas, no medications for those with mental illnesses, uh, none of the griefs that linger with us throughout life over the people we've lost or the things that we've endured. No more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain or suffering. There will be no more curse Remember where all that came from. At the very beginning, there was a paradise. It wasn't completely what it was going to be yet, but there was a garden, and there was a beautiful creation. And if Adam and Eve had tended it well and expanded that garden throughout the rest of creation, it could have been um, an even greater paradise. But they sinned, they listened to the serpent, and a curse came upon the creation. Again, we don't know what it's like to live in a creation with no curse, where Our work is often frustrated, where um, children die in infancy, where tragedy strikes, uh, where moms um, give birth, and even that that moment of great joy is one of terrible pain, where children uh, bring great joy but also great heartache. Uh, These are all just the results of that curse that hit the creation and shattered what it was meant to be. Well, in paradise, no more curse. The relationships 
all healed, uh, the, the universe all working the way it was meant to work. Uh, you've, you've had days like that, haven't you, where uh, stuff just breaks down, things go wrong. Um, that's all part of a messed up world, and it won't be messed up anymore. Well, in addition to the things that, that are part of the curse, there will be some things that won't be there that um, Revelation pictures, and let's think about those. It says, uh, there was no longer any sea. And some of you say, well, rats! I, I like boating. I like um, being on the beach. Uh, it'd be kind of a ripoff to get to the new creation and not have any lakes or oceans. Well, I don't think that it's saying there will be no lakes or oceans. When it says there will be no more sea, it says um, that in the context of the old order of things passing away. In the book of Revelation, what comes out of the sea? Well, the beast comes out of the sea. The one who is sometimes labeled the the godless one or the antichrist or Gog, the the beast comes out of the sea. When the prostitute uh, that... Wicked Babylon, where does she sit? She sits on the sea, which represents many wicked nations in rebellion against God. So in Revelation, very often the sea is just that chaotic something or other that evil comes out of. And there simply won't be any chaos from which evil emerges anymore. So we shouldn't read no more sea means, okay, um, no more Lake Michigan, no more Pacific or Atlantic Ocean. The point is not that there will be no more large bodies of water, but that there will be no more chaos from which the monsters and the evil comes against us. There will be no more night. There again, maybe that just means that there's perpetual brightness and shining Or maybe God will let there be night in the sense that there will be enough darkness to see some stars and enjoy them. However that may be, the sense that there is no more night means that God will continue to give us His brightness and His glory. It says there's um, no more lights. At least there won't be a need for lights. The city won't need the sun to shine on. It won't need the moon. It won't need a lamp. uh, Because the Lord God and the Lamb are It's light. Maybe you remember your days of creation a little bit from Genesis 1. Light came on the first day. The bodies that give light actually didn't show up till the fourth day. And some people say, oh, that can't be that. That's just ridiculous, and it proves it's a myth. Well, whatever you happen to think of that order of things, the Bible ends pretty much the way it began by saying, yeah, there's going to be plenty of light, and you really won't need the sun or the moon to provide it. Because if God says, let there be light, he himself is light, and he gives it. There will be no temple in the city. We'll say a little bit more later about um, paradise being a temple, and yet there's no temple in the city. Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So in another sense, there is a temple, and we'll say more about that. But you won't need buildings, sacred buildings anymore. A tabernacle, or a beautiful temple, or even churches or houses of worship. I think it probably means there won't be any preachers there. I'm really hoping, and I do trust, that some of us will make it, but we won't be preaching anymore because everybody will know the Lord from the least of them to the greatest. And my little fumbling sermons that try to say a little bit of this or that about God, you you know, in hindsight, I'll be kind of embarrassed about my sermons and and you'll say, boy, that sure, didn't, that sure didn't reveal very much about the Lord. Uh, but, you know, that's the means of grace, as we call it, that God gives us here on earth. Um, times to gather, times to worship in places set apart by people called to proclaim the good news. And yet there you just don't need temples or churches or anything else because God is there in all his beauty and glory. And all those other means are set aside as the reality is fully before us. There won't be marriage there, except that um, we're going to see that that, uh, we are a bride. But Jesus himself said in in that new creation, there won't be marriage or giving in marriage, and we're going to be like the angels in in that sense, that, that marriage is a type of relationship that is beautiful and wonderful and meant to reveal things about God, but it's something, not that's just going to be trashed, but something that we grow beyond where we may still 
I'm sure, appreciate and love and know and recognize the spouses whom we had on earth, but that relationship is going to be swallowed up into something even greater that we um, can't imagine yet. Another little tidbit, um, I don't think there will be any zoos in that new creation either, and not because there won't be any animals. You will not need to separate animals from each other anymore, and you won't need to separate animals from people or have things to prevent them from running away from you because that is a, a creation of perfect harmony among animals and among people and the animals. So those are some of the things that aren't going to be in paradise. And thank God for what's not in paradise. Well, what is there? Let's think about four things from this great passage of Scripture that we can learn about paradise. It's a garden, a city, a temple, and a family. And if you say, well, I thought you just said there wasn't a temple. Well, the temple um, and family both are, are lifted to a higher level. First of all, it's a garden. When the vision comes, he sees the tree of life. And the tree of life brings healing. It brings life, eternal life. It's delicious and pleasurable. It's a sign that God pours out all of his life and his pleasures and his gladness on us. And that tree of life that we were banned from after the sin in the Garden of Eden, we have access to it again. And there is the river of life. And that river of life is the same as there was in the garden. The garden originally in Genesis says there was a garden that flowed from Eden. And so you have the river, and then on each side of the river, the tree of life. And when Revelation early in the book speaks of the destiny God has for us, it says, the very first promise that he gives to the seven churches, it says, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And here you see a little more elaboration on that promise, the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The very early part of Genesis or of Revelation, and then in the very last chapter, near the very end, it says, blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. You remember that terrible scene in Genesis 3 where Adam and Eve are kicked out of paradise. No more access to the tree of life. And God sets a cherub, mighty angel with flaming sword to prevent anybody from ever entering in this age, ever entering paradise and eating again from the tree of life. But there, the angels are not banning people at the gates, they're welcoming people in. And the tree of life is there for the eating, and its leaves are for the healing of the nations. Now here again, Revelation is simply showing us again a vision that God gave centuries earlier. Ezekiel chapter 47 says, on the banks, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. That's the river of life and the tree of life. And in Ezekiel's vision, um, there's a measuring of this river. And at first, when it comes out of the sanctuary, it's uh, very shallow and then the further you go along that river, somehow it keeps getting deeper and deeper. First it's up, you know, to your knees, then it's up to your waist, and finally it's this mighty river that you can't stand in and that you can only swim and splash around in. That's the mighty river of life that God has in mind. And whatever, whatever that means, the literal rivers and literal trees that bring us life and healing, we know that often in the Bible... The water of life, the spring of life, is God the Holy Spirit, whom God pours out upon us. And if he does that by means of a river and a tree that we eat of, whether he does that directly, this, this picture of the tree of life bringing healing, pleasure, gladness, and the river of life, it's a restoration of the reality of the Garden of Eden, only better. Another picture of a garden is that it's a great and high mountain, uh, in his vision, he sees this great high mountain, and there again he awakens echoes of many of the things that God has promised before. In 
Isaiah, he says, On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the sheet that covers all nations, the shroud that covers all peoples. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. That's what God is going to do on this mountain. And so you have this picture of the great and mighty mountain, of the rivers, of the tree of life. And every time you look at a wondrous mountain, even now, think of that coming mountain. Every time you see a river or a beautiful stream, think of that river of the water of life that's going to flow forever. Every time you look at a beautiful tree or eat some delicious fruit, just remember there's better coming. These just are appetizers or faint memories of what once was and reminders of what's coming again. And in that garden, what were Adam and Eve called to do? Well, they were, they were called to tend it, to take care of it, to make it better and better, to develop it, in other words. You might wonder, what in the world are we going to do in paradise? We just get to sleep in every morning and then get up and then do nothing? Uh, maybe, you know, for one thing, you won't need to sleep because you won't get tired. But uh, for another thing, work is going to be something enjoyable, not drudgery. And it's going to be succeeding at everything you do and using all the gifts and abilities God gave you to bring out the best in the creation around you and to develop it in wonderful... The stuff we call science now, it gives us just a little bit of hint at what could be when it's not poisoned by other agendas and by our own weaknesses and ignorances. Uh, the, the things you do in woodworking or in building, the Bible says, hey, they'll build houses and live in them. They'll plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Uh, the, the work that we do in developing that beautiful creation is going to be something that is going to be a lot of fun. And yeah, we can relax. The Bible speaks of children playing in the streets of the city. Uh, all these pictures are there of that perfect garden. What else is on the mountain? Well, in Isaiah chapter 11, it says that the Lord will have it so that nothing will harm or destroy on all his holy mountain. He says, the wolf will live with the lamb... The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea." There will be a, a perfect harmony of the animals among each other and of humanity with the animals. We were appointed to govern the animal kingdom. And when we blew it, it messed things up for the animals too. That's the short version. And when we're restored to our proper position and our proper way of handling that position in governing creation, then everything will be set right with the animal kingdom too. You can start guessing about what else that might mean, uh, whether animals will be able to communicate with us in ways they can't now. I, I got a brother that trains dogs. Those dogs already know quite a bit of what he's talking about. Uh, who, what, who knows what will happen when we get into a creation where, where our stupidities and the curse are removed and the animals and the people are in perfect harmony. The Bible even goes further than that, and it speaks of, all creation dancing. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that feels, fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then all the trees of the forest will shout for joy before the Lord. You have a lot of prophecies and songs about creation dancing and rejoicing. What, what's God going to do with the plant kingdom the, and the mountains even? What's it mean when they're praising the Lord and, and when they're rejoicing? You might say, yeah, that's just poetry. Um, yeah, but sometimes there are things so amazing that only poetry and not quite prose can express it at this point in time. But the creation itself is going to be set free from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. And, of course, another great thing, indeed the best thing about the Garden of Eden, was that God himself would come into that garden and he would walk with them, and he'd talk with them, 
And after they sinned, they were afraid of that, and they couldn't be in the garden, and they never had that same relationship again. But it will be restored. And I know some people, I know a lot of old people who like a song called In the Garden. And there are others who detest that song because um, they think it's bad poetry or whatever. But I understand what its appeal is. I come to the garden, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. This is, whatever you think of the poetry, the deepest longing of the human heart. To be in the paradise of God and to be walking with him and talking with him, not just at a distance in prayer, but so directly that we know he's right there with us at all times, and we hear him speak, and he listens to us speak. Walking and talking with God is the supreme delight of the garden. It's also a temple, and I know it says, I did not see a temple there, but it also says the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. It says, Behold, the dwelling of God, or the tabernacle of God, is a better translation, is with men, and he will live with them. That was the whole point of tabernacle and temple all along. The place where God showed up on earth, and the place where you could go to meet God. But there were various levels, and you could get into the outer court, maybe. If you were a priest, you could get into the inner court. If you, could get, if you were the high priest, you, might, you could get into the Holy of Holies once a year. That's how the temple worked. It was largely forbidden territory in its innermost part. What is it about this new creation? In the vision, it is a cube, an enormous cube. And that cube is the very same shape as what? The Holy of Holies of the temple. Now the Holy of Holies is not a little cube where one person gets to go once a year. It is a vast and gigantic space where all are welcome all the time. And we read sometimes with longing of the tabernacle being filled with the brightness, the Shekinah, the shining or the glory of the Lord. And that brightness will fill the Holy of Holies. And It says, we shall see his face. So often in the Bible, there is this prayer, Lord, let your face shine upon us that we may be saved. The great blessing of the priest is, may the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The great longing of those who love God is expressed in Psalm 27. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. My heart says of you, seek His face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. That is the heart's cry of believers expressed in Psalm 27, and Revelation says that our heart's desire is going to come true. We shall see his face, the face of the one who loved us and bled for our salvation, the face whose shining is beauty, the face that brings all good things and life. And not only does it say that this is this huge holy of holies where we actually see his face, but it says basically that we are all of priests of God. That's said again and again throughout the book of Revelation, but here in Revelation it speaks of his name being on our foreheads. Now, who has God's name on their forehead? Just quick dial back to Exodus 28. It says, You shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it, Holy to Jehovah, or Yahweh, or the Lord. And you shall fasten it on the turban by a cord of blue on the front of the turban on Aaron's forehead. The high priest of God is the one with Holy to the Lord, on his forehead. So when it says they shall see his face and his name will be on their foreheads, it means that you are like Aaron, the high priest of God, who gets to go into the Holy of Holies. Only you get to be there perpetually and never leave. So when you think about the temple, you know, maybe some of us are, you know, temples, you know, that's grand architecture and all that, but it doesn't really make your heart go pitter-patter. Well, does the thought of seeing his face out of being always in his presence and in that great and glorious holy of holies, does that make your heart go pitter-patter? 
It is a place where everything is paved with gold or covered with gold, and it's this beautiful, transparent, shining gold. The tabernacle, uh, the Holy of Holies, the temple, everything was gold. So these are all ways of saying that the things the tabernacle pointed to, that the temple pointed to, are fulfilled in paradise. And ultimately, the Bible says over and over, we're God's temple. Your body, even now, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The church is God's temple. Um, God's people together are His temple. But here it kind of goes beyond that, saying we're His temple. And it says He is our temple. God and Christ are our temple. We don't need a building anymore simply because we're dwelling in God. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 of the new creation, he says God's going to put all things under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And when Christ hands the kingdom over to the Father, then God will be all in all. That's what's meant by God being our temple. He's our everything. He's our all in all. God is our place of worship. None of the helps, none of the symbols anymore. God himself. Another thing, of course, is that paradise is a city. And in that city that we see, it's coming down out of heaven from God, but it does come down to earth, and we need to remember that it is ultimately an earthly city as well as a heavenly city. It's heaven on earth. And that city is run by somebody. It's organized, and somebody's on the throne. God and the Lamb reign in that city. The city has gates. It tells us that each gate is made of a giant pearl. It tells us that every gate is open, that it's never shut. You always have full access to God in paradise because the gates are never shut. At each of those gates stands an angel, but now not with a flaming sword to keep people away from God, but to welcome people into the presence of God. And each of those gates has a name on it in the vision, and each of those gates has a name of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. When you get to the foundations, it has 12 great foundation stones, and each of those has the name of one of the apostles. So here again, the vision is showing us that, that God's Israel and the God's church are all one in that great paradise of God. And that city is a city of 12s. It's 12 everywhere. And that's why you have to be a little careful about the modern translations. They improve and tell you, yeah, they don't say 12,000 stadia. They say very helpfully, that's 1,440 miles. Well, thank you very much, but the whole point was 12, okay? It's 12 times 1,000. 12 is a great number of completeness. 1,000 is a great number of completeness. They're not just giving us literal math here. The point is in the 12s and in the completeness and in the thousands. So it is the... It is that great unified city where Israel and church are together. Um, It is 12,000 stadia cubed, a place of great unity where all nations are part of that city. It's kind of interesting that it tells us about the wall. That's another 12 times 12, 144 cubits. And Shining, what will it be like to have the brightness of God himself shining on his greatest jewels? And a final thing about the city is that it's not just a throne where God and the Lamb reign. It is also a throne that God shares. The final promise that Jesus makes to the seven churches, and to one of the rottenest of the churches, by the way, but if they'll repent um, and welcome him in, then his promise is this, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. 
just as I sat down with my father on his throne. We share in his throne. They will be a kingdom and priest to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. That means that God, we're back to our original position. In Genesis 1, God appointed Adam and Eve to rule over the beasts of the earth and, and all the creatures that move along the ground and, and the animals. In Psalm 8, it celebrates the fact that God placed all things under his feet, all flocks and herds, beasts of the field, birds of the air, fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. These things that we sing about and that we have a partial taste of because even in our fallenness, God gives us a, a bit of authority over the earth. It'll be released fully and we will have complete authority. That means that, that our bodies will be able to do some things that are hard to imagine now. Um, Jesus could walk on water, and I don't think that's just because he was divine. It was his human body walking on water, exercising his rightful authority over the elements. When Christ comes again, um, gravity isn't going to hold us down. We're going to rise up and fly up to meet him. Our bodies are going to have certain capacities that go beyond anything we know now, and in part because we're going to have additional authority over how our bodies operate, but also over how the creation operates. The Bible even suggests that we will judge the angels. It comes up in a strange passage, uh, or at least a strange setting to talk about ruling the angels. It talks about Christians suing each other. And the apostle says, are you guys crazy? Uh, you're going to be judging angels, and you're suing each other over a few dollars? What are you doing? But, but he just takes it for granted. Yeah, all Christians know that someday they're going to be judging the angels and, and governing angels, and angels are going to be our, our helpers. That's part of ruling with Christ, because remember, Jesus did not become an angel. He became human. And in becoming human and being exalted again to the throne of God, he dragged humanity up with him and raised and promoted and exalted humanity above the level even of the mighty and wonderful angels of God. Well, when we look at that city, um, it's worth pointing out real quickly that there's a sharp contrast between the two cities in Revelation, between the New Jerusalem and Old Babylon. The New Jerusalem is a pure bride, the wife of the Lamb. Old Babylon is a whore fornicating with earthly kings. The New Jerusalem enlightens the nations. The Old Babylon corrupts the nations. The New Jerusalem attracts the good things and the kings and the cultural treasures of the earth, and old Babylon bullies the kings. The New Jerusalem preserves those cultural treasures as they're brought into the city, and old Babylon, everything's for sale, even bodies and souls. The New Jerusalem has no sorcery, no filth, no falsehood. Old Babylon is full of sorcery, filth, and falsehood. New Jerusalem has the water of life. Old Babylon is drunk on blood. New Jerusalem is unconquerable. Old Babylon is fallen. And a final picture of paradise is, a, is the picture of family, of loving relationships, of the bride in particular, and of the child, of, of the children of God. We're Jesus' bride, we're his love and his delight, and we're his children. And the uh, the book of Revelation speaks of that just beautifully. It says, um, let us rejoice and be glad. This is chapter 19. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. When John sees the new Jerusalem, he says she's prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. When he's about to get his tour of the paradise, the angel says, come, I will show you the bride the wife of the Lamb. And as is the case so often, Isaiah has spoken of this long before. As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Isaiah 62, verse 5. So this, this picture of the love that Jesus has for his people. Marriage is just a little taste of that. The best marriage is only a little taste of that. Uh, the worst marriage, of course, doesn't give us much of a taste at all. And one of the reasons why a broken marriage hurts so much is because there's something in us that longs for so much in marriage because we're, we're meant for a higher level of marriage. Jesus' bride 
is with him and the love and delight in him that we have in relating to him, uh, that's going to be one of the greatest joys for all eternity. And the Bible also says, He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I'll be his God, and he'll be my son. You're a child of God, an heir of God. If we're children, then we're heirs. Everything that's his is ours, including even his throne. We've seen that now. He, he's willing to share even his throne. What else is there? If, if he shares his throne, there is absolutely nothing that he won't share with us. The logic also of the Bible is if he gave us his son, what, what wouldn't he give us? So if he gives us his son and, and shares his throne, I don't think you need to worry about God holding something back in the new creation that would bring joy and delight. And part of being um, his beloved, part of being his bride, as the Bible says again and again, is the banquet, the feast, the celebration, the eternal pleasures. And the greatest of all those pleasures will simply be delighting in the Lord. You know, a lot of people look forward to different things about heaven, and, well, we should. It's going to be a place of reunion. The Bible reminds us that don't, when somebody dies, don't grieve as those who have no hope. You're going to see them again. They're going to be raised again. They're going to be glorified. So don't grieve as though you had no hope. There's going to be this wonderful reunion. We're going to know our loved ones in heaven. We're going to enjoy fellowship with them. We're going to enjoy meeting a lot of different people that we didn't know on this earth. The great heroes of the Bible. You can talk as long as you want with Abraham or Sarah, with Mary or John or any of the great heroes of faith in the scriptures. Some of those people from history. Some of those who were um, heroic martyrs. The people who helped um, bring the gospel in another generation and were part of the chain of truth and gospel sharing that got the message to you. And you're going to see angels and realize what your guardian angels did and how they were helpful to you throughout this life. So the reunion, the fellowship, the knowing, the feasting, the gladness, the pleasure, that's all a huge part of paradise. And, you know, the Bible compares it to a wedding feast. Now, when you think of a wedding feast, what are the things you look forward to? You look forward to all of that pageantry and all of that beauty and all of that uh, fun that you're going to have at the reception and all the people you're going to see. And some of them are going to be people you haven't seen for quite a while. They're going to be coming from out of town, sometimes a long ways away, and you get to see them. And that's all great. But if you're the bride, you might look forward just a wee bit to the groom. You know, when we th think of heaven, we think of the reunion with these people and the pleasures and the joys and what exciting things it'll do, be, you know, what's it going to be like to interact with the animals in a new way or to go to those waterfalls that we hadn't had a chance to see in this life or maybe journey to a distant star or, or a different system or galaxy. What, what a thrill that would be. But once again, all the joys that we look forward to are going to seem, uh, they'll be wonderful, but the greatest joy is simply going to be seeing our Lord and delighting in Him. He's, he's the fountain of it all. The other things are only droplets. He's the ocean. He's the sun. All these other things are just rays. And so in paradise, we'll be seeing our Father and delighting in Him. And that will be one of our supreme joys. But perhaps the greatest joy of all won't be us delighting in Him, but Him delighting in in us, the Bible says, as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. He will rejoice over you with singing. What will it be like to hear the voice that made the universe singing over you? What will it be like for him to say, come and share my joy, that infinite, vast, unending, immeasurable joy? All his, all mine where God is all in all. This is what the scriptures, I, like I said, I'm going to be embarrassed someday about this sermon, um, but not because I said too much, but because I could only stammer a wee little bit about things that I hardly know about. When you get there to the garden, the city, the temple, the great family of God, then, then you'll know what I was talking about. I hope you have a little hint now. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will um, 
kindle our hearts with a longing to see your face and a longing for your kingdom to come on earth and your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, for heaven itself to come down to earth and make this your dwelling place forever in perfection. Lord, we look forward to paradise and may we be among those to whom you make the promise, the one who overcomes will have the right to the tree of life in the paradise of God. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.